Um, I, I actually was going to uh, not call you the, the, the queen of catalysis or the queen of England of catalysis. Rather, as you had noted, you debate soccer with your group sometimes, the Sir Alex of catalysis. Uh, I'm going I'm to try that out and see if it sticks. Uh, understanding you have a team behind you in all of that. Um, uh, uh, but moving away from soccer, um, <laughs> unless you want to stick with soccer. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I believe earlier today you, you were speaking with a reporter about the story of how your parents um, raised you and your, and your brother, and your brother was first in the family to go to, to college. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about uh, that, that story, your, your uh, upbringing, and the role of your parents, and, and how that translates into the advice you give students uh, as they start out in their career. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I grew up in Western Scotland, uh, just outside of Glasgow. It was a working class family. My father was a steel worker. My mom was a home help. And uh, basically, I went to the school called Belsall Academy, which was a fantastic learning experience in many, many different types of ways. Um, my brother wanted to go to college, but no one we knew of ever went to college, and we didn't know of anyone who went to college. And so, but my brother was determined, despite everyone trying to convince him otherwise. And then he went off to college, and, and he did that, and he came out, and he got a job. And the first day he got a job, he made more money in his salary than, than my dad as a steelworker made. And my dad told me that day, I was going to, I was going to college. <laughs> and so I had no choice in the matter. Um, so for me, that was, it was important because it, it was that sort of moment of sort of learning that there is this world outside of your own world, and there are sort of these frontiers that you can go off and be part of and enjoy and see the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, I'm internally grateful to my parents, obviously, but also to my brother for, because he was the one who took the leap. I was the one who was just told what to do. And so, I, you know, that was basically the story I was telling them of, of why, you know, it's, you know, we all have these kind of interesting sort of, pathways that we move through life and that was certainly some an interesting part for me and one to my parents and my, my brother that'll be my sister's going to kill me for saying all of this actually but um but yeah that's that, that's why it was important thank you thanks for sharing all right let's turn to the floor then and see if we have a question from the media and uh, mike kotchke is here in the front will help identify you so please raise your hand if you have a question And we can also uh, entertain questions from the broader community if, if someone would like to, to raise a question for the professor. As questions are being formulated, maybe I'll try another one. Uh, I won't switch uh, fields of play, but uh, maybe looking ahead a little bit, um, what, what do the next few weeks hold for you? Or is it uh, Thursday is a normal Thursday? Uh, or, or, or is it back-to-back uh, -back interviews? What do you think uh, lies ahead, or do you know? I have no idea what's about <laughs> to, to uh, a bunch of my friends were contacting me, asking me if I want to go to Vegas with them, but I'll probably, uh, <laughs> well, maybe I'll sort of pass on that at least for a week. Um, uh, but no, I, I, I think I'm going to, uh, try and enjoy the next few days, um, um, enjoy it with my group as well. We have a big group event planned for next week. We have a celebration planned for a different reason, so I'm sure that'll be a great celebration next week. And uh, yeah, just um, have a great time sort of catching up with all the, the well-wishers on email and text, etc., cetera, um, and, and talking to people uh, live. Um, I guess I'm talking to BBC at, at 4.45, and I never thought I'd ever be on a call with the BBC, so that's gonna be really, really, uh, well, not for good reasons, anyway, but the, uh, oh, no. so, so I'm sort of excited to see how that's going to go. Well, we know there's a lot of pride on both sides of the Atlantic, so <laughs> it makes sense. All right. Mike, do we have a question? Excellent. My name is Dean Edelman. Uh, that's a name, not a title. I work in corporate engagement and at Princeton University. Congratulations, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Uh, first, I want to thank you. When I first left private sector to come here, uh, people asked what I loved about this, and I said I love playing a small role in the effort of everybody in supporting people who could one day win a Nobel Prize, and you've made a, an honest man out of me, so thank you very much. Um, the question is, um, uh, we heard Debbie uh, mention uh, Merck, uh, and when I talk to people in academia and at outside, they often view the pursuit of knowledge that leads to a Nobel Prize as one thing and research with industry as another. 
Um, can you share how you view engagement with industry relates to your research? Sure. I mean, I think all of the chemists who are here today know the same, very much know this. I mean, there, there's fundamental research, and fundamental research is unbelievably important. But we all understand, too, that there are these industries that impact society that are doing remarkable, remarkable research and doing it at a level that I think just increases and expands every single year and to the point that they are having, obviously, a, a dramatic impact on society. When you have these two tremendous research communities that exist side by side, it's almost nonsensical for them not to build bridges between the two and, and try and take what we are developing here and get it towards really important applications, whether that's medicine, materials, you name it. It, it's, it. it doesn't make sense not to do that. So Dean, Ian Davies is here, a lot of other people at Princeton, a lot of people at a lot of different universities do care enormously about how do you get these fundamental findings, these understandings, and get them to the point where it has benefit for society. We have to do that. It would be crazy not to. So I think that's something that's becoming more and more important and more people are, you know, clearly care about doing so. Thank you. We have another question. Yeah, reminded to look upstairs as well in case there's someone who might. We have microphones there as well. Hi, I'm Chris Sims, a professor in the economics department. Uh, your uh, research has been characterized as, in some sense, green. Um, and I don't really understand in what sense it is green, and I would be interested to hear you elaborate on that. Yeah. It, you know, that's a, that's a great... I, I'm, I'm going to have to look up green in the dictionary later on. Not that I don't think our research is green. I just don't know what the accepted definition of green really means at this point. Um, what I would say is that what we were involved with and what we developed and what this prize is about was there was an understanding that you could do catalysis. And catalysis does impact every single component of our life, even though chemists are not great at explaining that to people. But it, it changes everything we do in our lives. And if you think that the catalysts that are out there, and many of them are metals, and they're spectacularly important, but there was clearly a, an opportunity or a way to think about how you could replace some of those metals with organic molecules. And organic molecules, as we all know, are, you know, you think about your hand, your body, it's organic, right? It exists in the atmosphere, it exists, it's benign. It doesn't, you know, when, when you know, human beings, despite our actions, human beings themselves, your, their molecules are not problematic to the planet. So if you can make catalysts from those organic molecules, you clearly can do something that hopefully can allow you to, all those catalysis efforts, some of them known, some of them unknown, to go forward, but also do it in the context of using molecules which are going to be biodegradable and benign to, to the planet. So in that context, I'm pretty sure that's, that's what it means. Um, I think the other part, though, which I think everyone here cares about, and this group over here, is trying to come up with new ways to make molecules undergo reactions with each other, or reactivity, or reactivity principles. And new ways of coming up with doing catalysis is going to be so critical to everything we're trying to do as a planet. It's extraordinarily important. Whether it's metals, whether it's not metals, whether it's organic, we have to do that. We've only scratched the surface, and, but we have to do so much more if we're going to have the impact that we need to have. I love hearing that, and you've just received the Nobel Prize, and you're looking at what the next challenge is and realize that there's important impact to, to still be had. Uh, Mike, our next question in the back. Hi, I'm uh, Diane Dezebo from AFP. Um, you were saying this morning that you were in disbelief, that you thought it was a prank. Um, now that it's sinking in, first of all, how do you feel? Um, and what impact do you hope that this prize will have? Thank you. How does it feel? Um, I would say, um, I would say um, it's dazed and confused. I would say it's, it's just incredibly excited, um, incredibly um, surreal. Um, I, I'm still trying to find the feet, my feet underneath me, to be honest, quite now. 
but it's all it's a whirlwind but it's a kind of fun whirlwind i would say uh, it's very bizarre but at the same time it's given me a moment to you know it's one of those weird moments in life where you have to sit about think about all the people who got you here and it makes you very sentimental actually in an interesting sort of way um and the second part of your question sorry i was um the impact on me or or for for the world <laughs> um i think you know the impact is my group is going to have to work even harder to prove um, <laughs> to prove that they deserve this i think you know i that's that's clearly the number one impact uh the second impact i think this will clearly make the university realize what they've got in the chemistry department so they're going to clearly have to put more resources behind chemistry <laughs> um sorry baby. um Yeah, but I also, I mean, in a tiny, tiny way, every time we can explain chemistry to the outside world, that's a really kind of fun thing to do. And I think it'll, hopefully we can keep communicating. We have fantastic scientific communicators here at, at Princeton. And if we can keep communi communicating to the outside world, we obviously have big problems we have to address as a world. And it's going to have to happen through chemistry. And so as long as we can keep communicating, I think that's a good thing. Several of us were taking notes furiously as you were speaking, and for the communication side, uh, we are certainly uh, invoking catalysis in a way we never have before. So we'll be an ally in your communications efforts. Uh, do we have another uh, another question? I see a hand to the right hand side here. Hi, Dave. Uh, I'm Wendy Plump. I'm from the Department of Chemistry. This um, Nobel is for previous work that you've done years and years ago. Your group has since pivoted and is going in a new direction. So I wondered if you could talk about the necessity for a scientist to continually create and in different directions. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I did bring a PowerPoint presentation as well, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> the, um, no, thanks, Wendy. I mean, what my group is really excited about is, we just talked about it, these new reactivity ideas, like how do you make molecules and reactions do things they've never done before? And how can you get that to impact the world? So we're doing a lot of that, as Debbie mentioned, with light, um, which it turns out there's a lot you can do with light. Greg is one of the experts in understanding this. So we're really working hard to try and figure that out. In terms of where we're going with that, New transformations are going to be important, uh, but we're also moving into an area of trying to use this for chemical biology. And people like Tom Muir, who are sitting in the front row, have been fantastic at sort of coaxing me and pulling me into that world in, in terms of the new innovations and ways that you can sort of get insights the way Tom's group has insights in biology. And I really do think that that's also an area where we think the insights can be really profound and, and, and expansive. So we're really excited about moving catalysis into exploring the, the biological world. Thank you, Wendy. Do we have any other questions? Uh, we have back. Hi, Liz Fuller Wright, Office of Communications. Uh, you mentioned that you can have an experiment on a Tuesday and see a result in the real world on a Friday. It sounds like you're thinking of a story. Can we hear it? Sorry. Uh, what was the example of seeing a reaction on a Tuesday and having it affect the world on a Friday? We deal with this all the time, where we sit in subgroups all the time, and, and these are some of the best scientists in the world. They're, you know, 21, 22 years old, and they're literally doing experiments on a Tuesday. They discover something, and we have discussions with major pharmaceutical companies all the time, and they learn about what we're doing, and they're literally employing it on a Friday. And when you come back, sometimes I tell my group this and they don't believe me. And then they actually get to see these companies widely employing these transformations that are happening here at Princeton and being adopted so rapidly. And there's two parts to that which I think are really wonderful. The first part is people who are just starting off on their PhD, seeing that the impact of what they are doing can really immediately be translated into a, a medicine or a medical purpose. And I think the second part is just the rate of adoption and the, the rate at which it's happening now is fantastic. It's so fast, but at the same time, it makes it really, really important that what we're doing can be translatable, that will, have an, will be used by people in those, those settings. So the Tuesday Friday thing is actually completely right. It's also, 
It's incredibly uh, exciting when you see a company making a drug using technologies that was developed in a little fume hood at the back end of a lab in Princeton. It's really, it's pretty neat. Thank you, Liz. We have a question in the back. Hi, um, I'm Angus Deaton, yeah, um, Angus. Economics. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about Bell Cell Academy and um, Glasgow University. Um, the, the Scottish education system in my cohort, which is a generation older than yours, had a, a bunch of very distinguished people, many of whom became Nobel laureates, many of whom now work in the United States. And I'd sort of wondered if the education system had faltered over the last, over the 20 years since then. But it sounds like your experience, you, like me, had a fabulous local high school that did wonders for you. No, 100%. And um, I, you know, I, you know, I grew up in a really working class neighborhood and went to a working class primary school and uh, had a spectacular education from people who, you know, the teachers were just spectacularly committed. And they didn't have to be, they just were. They were just, they were really cared enormously. And I think Scotland, Scotland's proud of a lot of different things, and uh, as we should be. And, uh, but we're very proud of our education. And uh, I think in high school as well, we have a, a brilliant high school education too. And then in Glasgow Uni, I think Glasgow University is, is you know, for at least from my perspective, as someone who went there petrified about going to college, uh, the way that the people really work hard to sort of bring people through in those uh, departments and get them excited about the science, again, was sort of part and parcel of why so many people, I think, go on and keep moving forward in those sciences. So yeah, it's a tiny little country, as you and I know, but it does really well in a, a number of different things. And I think education is, is Absolutely, one of, them. one of the things that we're very proud about. We can't be proud about our soccer team very often, so we have to be proud of other things. So, so education's good. Thank you, Sir Angus Deaton, a fellow Nobel laureate. Thank you for being here. Do we have another question? Hi, I'm Adam Sanders. I'm an undergraduate. Um, for those of us who are not super familiar with the products of your research, um, do you have any examples of like? Uh, commercial applications or applications in our day-to-day -day life that we might know of as being impacted by research into catalysis? Yeah, um, so organocatalysis is, well, the photoredox part is being used in making drugs every single day. There's too many of them to, to discuss. The organocatalysis in terms of scale up of producing uh, drugs, drugs on an enormous scale suitable to be enough material for society Merck, Novartis, I think Pfizer have all used organocatalysis to do that numerous times. I'll give you one other example is that there's a, a flavor and fragrance company in Geneva in Switzerland called Firmenich, and they use organocatalysis and they are using it to make this molecule which is called the Bloom constituent. And the Bloom constituent is as mundane as this sounds, is when you, you take a shower in the morning, you put your shampoo on and you get this bursty smell. And that bursty smell is actually, it's an artificial thing. It's, a, it's called the Bloom constituent. And it's made through organocatalysis. And the head of research there one day I was visiting Switzerland said, you know, we sell this Bloom constituent to all of North America. He said, you know, your graduate students will all be using this on a daily basis within six months. And I said, you don't know my graduate students. So. <laughs> Graduate students, uh, a response. Uh, microphones are around the floor. Um, <laughs> up top. Aggressive chemist, and not stand on the you know stand on the toes too much of the one's advisor. Well, what advice would you give to the younger? PhD students. Yeah. Transgressive chemist, someone that Transgressive kind of pushes chemist. the boundaries and pushes and tries. Oh, I'm not quite sure what that means, but uh, so. Well, you know, so, like, you know, someone that does research, uh, ground-based ground research without following, you know, the protocols of. Yeah. 
My, my personal, yeah. honest to goodness opinion is that every single person at Princeton University Chemistry Department does groundbreaking research. I am, you, and you'd be hard pressed to convince me otherwise. I would say that if you talk to those people and you talk to them about what gets them excited, you will learn it. I'm, I'm a big fan of the idea, a lot of people don't believe this, but I'm a big fan that you can learn to be creative. Um, creativity is not just this thing that you're born with, and we tend to sort of think that, and I don't believe that at all. I think you can learn to be creative. And I think if you talk to these people in our department, you talk to them about the problems that they're working on. They're all working on extraordinarily significant problems. And even more than that, a lot of the times they came up with the, the questions as much as the answers. And I think when you're surrounded by people who are like that, you will learn to do the same thing. It's a learnable skill set, to be honest. So I would argue spend time with them, watch what they do, and start to formulate your own questions. It's not about the answers necessarily, it's often about the questions. And, uh, sorry, could you hear me? Yeah, my name is Huang, I'm from Electrical Engineering, and uh, I'm actually very inspired by the Tuesday to uh, Friday story that you just shared. Um, however, I'm also aware that in recent progresses in other research, uh, some progress has been pretty arduous, time-consuming, labor-consuming, and it might be like a process development that lasts for a few years in a particular field. So I wonder if you could share a, a story about such any difficulty that you have seen in your career, and especially like how you uh, mitigated or overcome though, and how that might help link to faster progress like your Tuesday to Friday story. Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I knew all the answers to that one. Um, it is true that once, you know, there, unfortunately, there's a lot of fashion that happens in science which is a shame if you think about it. Science should be an absolute uh, component that we should all care about and be able to evaluate and move forward with. But a lot of time there is fashion associated with it. What we really need is to be able to demonstrate and allow the community to understand how to adopt and move on with the sort of key discoveries faster. And that's a really, really difficult thing to do because there's so much going on, right? So the question is, how do, you, how do you allow adoption to happen faster? My personal story was we did this work using light, and for probably four years, uh, I don't think really anyone took it seriously, because how do you light any a chemical reaction? How do you start to use light? No chemists really, and at least in organic chemistry, really use light very much outside of high energy UV. So it took a lot of time to sort of build up enough, um, I would say, convincing the community that it was real, that once it started to, that started to happen, it was kind of like an avalanche, and it just takes its own life, and off it goes. So I do, I do, do agree with you, there's many times when it's difficult to get the avalanche going, but it's worth pursuing it if you know that at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of value there. And there's a lot of things, again, that these people in the, in the front row are doing, which is extraordinarily valuable. But you're right, it does take time, often, to get the community behind it. But once they get behind it, it's worthwhile. And so you have to really spend time making sure that happens. It really is important. Hello? OK. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Adam Ryan. I'm, I'm actually a member of Greg's lab. Um, and the first thing that, so earlier in the day, we had the celebration for you, and uh, you brought up, or they brought up that uh, what really won this Nobel Prize was a two-page Jax paper. <laughs> and what that immediately reminded me of was um, the, the modern laser is based off a one-page report, too. So I guess my question is, how do you remain headstrong when uh, it's not like, a 10-page science or nature paper that uh, uh, got you the Nobel Prize. It's something that might be overlooked by someone or, in the field or so. How do you, how do you remain headstrong and, and confident in your science in that? Yeah, it's, um, that's a great, another great question. It's not easy. Um, the, and the other part is, we were talking about this this morning as well, there was so, it used to be there was no, not enough scientific communication out there. 
it feels like today there's so much scientific communication when you think about everyone putting so much of their work out on Twitter as well as other social media platforms to be able to determine what is really the, where is the, 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 the stronger parts, where is the parts that we should be gravitating towards. I do, though, believe, I mean, that paper it was a thing called the deals all the reaction. And just to be really boring to all of the other people who are not chemists here, a deals all the reaction, Eric will tell me, I think it was 1940s that deals all was developed. It was 1940s. 1948. And so, I mean, we, this, this paper that you're referring to, which literally helped get this field going, uh, cost probably to run the reaction must have cost about maybe somewhere between five cents and 10 cents to perform that experiment on a reaction that was invented in 1948. So it doesn't take a lot in terms of necessarily holding the, uh, the strengths to go forward on the nature of what you have to, the infrastructure, the equipment, all those things, although maybe in Greg's world it does. But I think it's the concepts, it's the ideas, and as long as the ideas are different and are going to lead to things which are beyond it, beyond what, I mean, it's way beyond what happened on that two-page paper. But the concept that was in that paper set the, it was the setting for all these other reactions that you could do thereafter, and that's the key part. So anyone that tells you it's expensive to get new research going, and I'm going to take this back in a second with Debbie. Anyone who, anyone, anyone who tells you that it's expensive to get new research going, it's not true, but it's the follow-through that's expensive. But the new concepts are, are not expensive. Thank you for the question. There's another one in the back. All right, Dave, you have to answer this question very carefully. Where is the next tri group trip going to be? So this is one of my graduate students. Who, they're always trying to get freebies out of me. And, uh, and, um, and Beryl is the best in the world at actually doing this, and that's why she was elected to ask this question. Um, the next trip, I, I feel, is, is going to be a really important trip. I think, you know, we really have to you know, start to think about maybe having group meetings twice a week. Um, and so I'm thinking, I'm trying to envision where another really nice setting, but you, there's always nice places in the world where we could go for a nice group meeting. So I think we'll think about that and come up with an answer later on when the provost is not here. All right. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sujay. I'm an undergraduate in electrical engineering. And you talked a lot earlier about your high school experience which, um, and your college experience, which contributed to where you are today. How do you think we can improve the scientific education at a younger age for students and encourage them to pursue paths in chemistry and other sciences like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. I, I mean, I'm not just saying this because I'm on this stage. I mean, Princeton is pretty remarkable, right? I mean, it, what it does for young people and undergraduates especially, it really goes the extra mile to bring everyone through. And I mean everyone through, scientific, and science and otherwise, which is really remarkable. And you know, I would not say that if I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't believe it, trust me. Um, so I think Princeton is, is pretty, I would say that the, the rest of the US is not as quite, up to, I don't think at the same level as Princeton. And I really do think if you want to bring younger people through to really get involved with science more, you have to expose them to it. You have to get them in labs. You have to get them thinking about what it's like to actually do science. And if you can sort of do it, you can sort of think about it and you can connect all those dots. So I do think getting more people exposed to it, obviously, is the smart way of doing it. Um, but yeah, I, I do think Princeton is remarkably good at doing it for undergraduates, actually. They're really good. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Meryl. I'm an undergraduate in chemical engineering. So my question is, um, what specifically like piqued your interest in exploring this novel field in the first place? And what are some of the biggest challenges you face maybe in the methodology of your research that might not be apparent to someone from the outside? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the, the hardest part is um, new reactivity. This thing I keep saying is really, really difficult. Um, if you actually look at the new reactivity principles, at least in catalysis, in the last 30 years, uh, I think there's like maybe 10 of them, and I think almost all the people who did that got Nobel Prizes. And so it's, if you can do it, it's extraordinarily important. 
but it's really, really hard to sort of get there. So, but again, I really believe we're just scratched the surface on being able to think about those new reactivity ideas. How do you get catalysts to do things that, to, with molecules that they've never done before? And it's, it's, it's absolutely available. And when you do it, it will, it will, it will have a big impact. So I think in a methodology sense, if I was giving someone an advice about going into catalysis, I would say don't focus on exploiting what's known. I would say focus on trying to invent a completely unknown way of, of trying to get molecules to react with each other. Hi, I'm Fred Houston. I'm in molecular biology. Um, it, this seems like the right quick time to ask um, for your take on the brief history of organic catalysis. Like, where did this idea, briefly, where did this idea come from? And so I'm yeah, laughing. This, story. Is, so this is Fred who's asking me a serious question. So um, <laughs> the only time I hang out with Fred all the time, usually drinking wine and playing poker. So it's really difficult to actually sort of be able to take this question seriously. Um, where did it come from? Uh, the organocatalysis part. It was basically uh, when I was a when I was a postdoc at Harvard. Um, every day I would roll in and I'd go to a glove box and I'd have to put my hands on a glove box for eight hours a day trying to get these metals to go into these vials and they would, so that they could react and, and do some chemistry. And this sort of blew me away that, you know, we're spending all this time and energy stuck behind these artificial circumstances to do catalysis. You know, nature does catalysis all the time. It doesn't use a glove box. So my, when I went off to Berkeley, one of my sort of big dreams was how do we come up with ways of doing catalysis that involve small molecules that everyone has in their stock rooms and you could actually get them, instead of being molecules as reagents or as substrates, how do we make them any catalysts? And so as soon as we, we did that, and as soon as it started working, then we started getting pretty excited about, could this be expandable? And then it, that's when it took off like gangbusters. It really went, it really went crazy. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> how are Fred's poker skills? Fred is a very, very good poker player. I think he always, I think he always comes in second, which means that, <laughs> No, that's a good thing because you get to take your money home. I say. Hi, David. Spencer Reynolds from uh, uh, Corporate Engagement and Foundation Relations. So in addition to bringing molecules together uh, on campus, you've also done a lot of work bringing people together. I'm thinking here of the uh, Princeton Catalysis Initiative. Could you talk a little bit about what inspired that originally and uh, what you think it's done for science on campus here? Yeah, no, the Princeton Catalysis Initiative has been fantastic. I mean, it really has been. Um, this was an initiative that was born out of myself, Tom Muir, Marty Semelhek, uh, basically chatting about ways to get scientists to talk to each other uh, more often. And not just scientists who live on the same corridor or in the same department, but live all over the campus. And so we took an idea with uh, Paul, Abby, and Rob, and we took an idea over to Debbie, Debbie and Chris uh, were incredibly receptive to funding this and getting behind this idea of how do you get people all over the campus to start working with each other. So we came up with the idea of speed dating for scientists. And speed dating for scientists is a symposium where scientists from all over the department come in and they give a five minute talk on what they're doing to all the other scientists from all over the campus. And then at the end of the day, they can send in a one slide PowerPoint on hopefully a project that connects two completely different departments who would never envision that they would work with each other or could not even envision that that would be possible. But after the speed dating event, they would know that they could do this. And, and at the end of the first uh, symposium, I think we had 64 different applications, which was fantastic. Industry and pharma and all these other big things, they got really excited about it. And we started off thinking that we would like to be able to fund maybe 50 collaborations. And I think now with the, all the different people who have got involved, I think we're now up to, we can fund 700 different collaborations on campus. And we don't think this has been done anywhere else in the US or in the world. And we do, we are beginning to see all these new types of research coming out of it that previously people had not sort of conceived of. So from our point of view, it was just an idea of how do you get all these scientists to just have these more collisions with each other so they could start, in, in informal ways, start talking to each other and start to do new things. And so far, it's been really wonderful. And again, I, I really have to thank the administration for getting behind it. 
That, that's great to hear. Certainly one of the things uh, I first heard uh, that distinguishes Princeton is the interdisciplinary nature of the research and the studies among students. Uh, what a great proof point, uh, as well as the investment the university makes in such things. Mike, do we have another? Oh, great. Hi, I'm Rebecca in the Bacarsley Lab. Um, just very broadly, what drew you to pursue a career in chemistry? What led me to pursue a career in chemistry? Um, I, <laughs> I'll tell, I'm not going to tell that. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> um, so basically, I, I went to college to be a physicist because my brother was a physicist. And I, I'm going to regret this. My wife's telling me right now, don't say it, don't say it. But I went and in the college, it was an eight o'clock in the morning class in this, this lecture theater, and it was freezing. And it used to, it was in Scotland, so it used to rain, and, the, and it would literally rain on you in the lecture theater. Meanwhile, the, the chemistry lecture theater was at 10 a.m., and it was warm and heated. Um, so in my second year at college, I had to make an executive decision, and uh, suddenly organic chemistry spoke to me. Uh, <laughs> My wife's going to absolutely kill me for telling me. That's actually a true story. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a profound note to... Uh, <laughs> we, do, we do have a minute or two for another question, if there is one. Hi, I'm John Minkilo from the Associated Press. We're living in a very precarious time where science is in question. As a scientist who has pursued a field that has changed the lives of everyone in this room and around the world, what message do you send to the wider world about the importance of science and what that means for our future? Yeah, that's a phenomenally deep question, obviously. I mean, without science, we don't have anything, right? I mean, we don't have society, we don't have ways of being, we don't have ways of interacting, we have nothing. So we need science. Once you get to that basic level of understanding, I think it's getting back to the whole, you know, trust in facts, trust in the truth. Um, I think we just have to rebuild this idea that we trust these institutions that we grew up trusting, right? Why would we stop to sort of throw them away? So at least from, from my sort of view on that is it's getting back to communication and trust. If we get back to communication, we get back to the trust, get back to understanding that science is, you know, we're, we're sort of doomed without it, right? So it's sort of critical that we, we have to care about science. Otherwise, it's, it, yeah, it's not going to go anywhere. That was the profound note that might uh, bring us to an end. Uh, if there are no further questions, thank you so much, Professor McMillan. Congratulations again to everyone in the audience. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and for uh, the combined uh, uh, celebration. Um, that celebration will continue just outside in the tent, a short walk away, when we will toast our newest Nobel laureate and our others in our community. Thank you again and congratulations.